too bad this passion fruit is not ripe for eating yet, but I hope you're ready for this next lecture because this time we're looking at the integrated rate law, which explains the rate from a different point of view. In that respect, I thought it appropriate to show you the island of Oahu from a different perspective. So as you prepare, check out some of this cool underwater life from the island of Oahu. Aloha. In our previous lecture, we discussed the differential rate law. And if you recall, for some reaction, A forms B, the reaction rate is expressed as rate equals a constant times the concentration of the reactant raised to some exponent, which is called the order with respect to reactant A. If you know the differential rate law of a reaction, meaning you know the constant, and the order, then you can substitute in any concentration of reactant and calculate the corresponding reaction rate. In other words, you tell me the reactant concentration and I will calculate and tell you the reaction rate. And in general, plugging in larger concentrations means you'll calculate larger reaction rates. This should make sense because if you have more reactant in the container, then the chemical reaction would be proceeding more often. Therefore, the faster the reaction would be. Now, in this lecture, we'll discuss a new formulation of the reaction rate, which is called the integrated rate law. Now, the differential rate law and integrated rate law are very closely related to each other. And to better understand this relation, let's look at the simplest case first, which is that of a zero order reaction. A chemical reaction is zero order when the exponent n is zero in the differential rate law. And since anything raised to the zero power is one, we would simply get the rate is constant. So for a zero order reaction, the differential rate law tells us that the rate is constant. Now don't forget that we previously defined the rate as the rate of change of concentration. And since we're talking about the reactant concentration, we precede this by a negative symbol because the rate of change of reactant concentration, since the reactant decreases, this would be negative. And that's why we need this negative symbol, since the negative times the negative, that would give us a positive rate overall. And we want positive rates. So our rate is constant for a zero order reaction. Now what we'll do at this point is we'll take our differential rate law for a zero order reaction and derive the corresponding integrated rate law. And we'll do this using two different methods, an algebraic derivation and also a calculus derivation for you students of calculus. Now, if you have not yet taken calculus, then do not be too concerned. This is not a course in chemistry which is calculus-based, but once you do take calculus, and I encourage you to do so, since many areas of science utilize it, and it would help to better understand the language in those areas. Once you do take it, you can come back and check this derivation to see that it makes sense. But for you students of calculus, you will perhaps appreciate this derivation, and it will also help you understand why we call it differential and integrated. <laughs> 
These are calculus terms. Let's first go through the algebraic derivation. So starting with our differential rate law, the rate is constant. We'll move the negative symbol over to the other side and the change in concentration over change in time becomes final minus initial concentration over final minus initial time. So that equals negative K. Now the denominator over here will move it to the right side and so we're left with final minus initial concentration equals negative K times final minus initial time. At this point we will set our initial time equal to zero seconds. So at the very beginning of the reaction we'll call that zero seconds. We'll count from zero instead of some other time. Doing that we have minus zero which we can ignore and also instead of calling it the final time we'll just call it the time and instead of calling it the final concentration we'll call it the concentration. And so we have this simpler equation. Now we're almost there and I'll go ahead and draw a box around this because we'll take a closer look at this form in a moment. But to get to the final form, let's go ahead and move our initial concentration over and we're left with the integrated rate law which tells us that the concentration, which is the final concentration, the concentration is equal to negative K times T plus the initial concentration. Now the integrated rate law is a little bit different than differential rate law. In the integrated rate law, what you do, if you know the initial concentration and of course the rate constant, then you can substitute in any value of time and calculate the new concentration. So you tell me how much time has passed and I will calculate and tell you how much reactant you have left. It's a little bit different than what we did up here. Now the integrated rate law and differential rate law are very closely related to each other. In fact they should tell us the same information because we took the differential rate law and derived the integrated rate law. And if you wanted to do so on your own time, you should be able to take the integrated rate law and work backwards to re-derive the differential rate law. So whatever these two equations tell us, we should understand the same thing. Now the differential rate law is telling us that the rate is constant. So that's what the integrated rate law should also explain. Before we look at that a little bit more closely to see that, let's first derive the integrated rate law using calculus. So we take our differential rate law over here and we turn it into the corresponding calculus equation. Now on the left hand side we have the negative rate of change of reactant A and that's equal to a constant. So we turn that into the calculus form which is the negative derivative of the concentration with respect to time and that's constant. Now over here we have the instantaneous rate. That's what the derivative is. It's the instantaneous rate and we can compare that with this which is the average rate over some finite time interval. But what happens when you take these time intervals and you make them smaller and smaller and smaller approaching zero, then the corresponding changes in concentration would get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you just call that dA over dt. So that's what the derivative is. It's basically your instantaneous rate when the time intervals and concentration changes are really, really small. So it's just different notation. Anyway, we take this calculus equation and we simplify it a little bit, move the negative sign over and dt and we're left with dA equals negative k dt. Now this is a straightforward integration and so we integrate both sides of the equation, the left hand side from initial to final concentration and the right hand side from initial to final time. 
the constant, of course, comes outside the integral. And so we solve this and we get the integrated forms, the left side from the initial to the final concentration and the right side, negative kt, from the initial to the final time. Now we end up with final minus initial concentration on the left equals negative k times final time minus k times initial time. At this point, we've reached the same equation, really, as we have over here. So we'll end up with the same integrated rate law. Now, you can, of course, use either derivation. They both work. When we get to first and second order, reactions, then we'll see that it's a little bit more tricky to derive the integrated rate law using algebra. It's much easier to use calculus. But at this point for zero order, they're basically the same difficulty. Now let's go back and understand a little better how these two are related. The differential rate law tells us that the rate is constant. So how do we see that down here? Well, we see that by recognizing that concentration is linear with time. This is a y equals mx plus b type of an equation. It's the equation of a line. And when your concentration is linearly related with time, that should tell you that it's a constant rate. Perhaps we can better see this by looking at that previous form where the final minus initial concentration, which is the change in concentration, is equal to negative kT. So this tells us that the change in concentration is directly proportional to how much time has passed. If you double the amount of time that's passed, you should double the change in the concentration. And if you triple the amount of time that's passed, you should triple the change in concentration. So that's a constant rate. But perhaps we can even better see that by taking these two forms and observing them on a graph. So let's go ahead and graph the rate versus concentration. The differential rate law tells us how the rate depends on concentration. So let's plot concentration on the x-axis and rate on the y-axis. And since for the zero order reaction, the rate is constant, when we plot rate versus concentration, if the rate is constant, then the rate should never change. It's always constant it's always the rate constant. So for a zero order reaction, rate versus concentration, we should simply get a horizontal line. And so it's obvious how the rate is constant. Now for the integrated rate law, if we know the time, then we can calculate the new concentration. So this tells us how concentration depends on time. So let's plot time as the x variable and concentration as the y variable. And since concentration is linear with time, what we would see when we plot concentration versus time using this integrated rate law right here again, we should see the straight line because concentration is linear with time. Now we can see the initial concentration is the y-intercept, which should make sense because at the very beginning of the reaction, the concentration is the initial concentration. And as time progresses, the concentration decreases. And it decreases along a constant slope which is the negative of the rate constant. Now think about this. When you have concentration versus time, we know that the rate is change in concentration over change in time, which simplifies to this. But when concentration is your y variable and time is your x variable, then change in y over change in x, that's simply the slope albeit 
the negative slope, but it's still the slope. And since when you have a straight line, the slope never changes, and the rate is the slope, then the rate never changes. So when you plot concentration versus time, and you get a straight line, the slope doesn't change, therefore the rate doesn't change. And so the rate is constant. Deriving the integrated rate law for a first order reaction is more tricky if we use an algebraic derivation versus a calculus derivation. Nevertheless, we're going to do both. So starting with our generic reaction, A forms B, the differential rate law is rate, which is this expression right here, it's equal to the rate constant times the concentration of the reactant raised to the first power. Now, we're going to take this differential rate law and using both an algebraic derivation, which is rather tricky, and a calculus derivation, we'll obtain the corresponding integrated rate law for a first order reaction. Now the integrated rate law for a first order reaction looks different than it does for a zero order. So let's see how we get this equation. Let's go through the algebraic derivation first. If we use the same sort of starting point that we used in the zero order case, we would take our differential rate law over here and simplify it a little bit to solve for the change in concentration. So the change in concentration equals all of this over here. Now this concentration term, concentration of A, was not present in the zero order case. And this is going to cause us trouble. But let's go ahead and proceed. The change in concentration is final minus initial concentration, and change in time is final minus the initial time. But we still have this concentration term here. And we cannot say that this is initial concentration or final concentration because it's neither. If we derive the integrated rate law, what we're trying to get to is an equation with the final concentration on one side and everything else on the other. We want to see how the final concentration depends on the time. Now we can solve for final concentration here by go ahead and moving the initial concentration over to the right but we would still have this term here. So this is not going to work. We cannot get rid of that term. We don't want that term in the final form of the integrated rate law, so this is a stopping point for us. We're going to use a different method to get the integrated rate law, and that method is to use, or really solve, a problem which is very similar to the extra credit problem that we used or we saw in lecture 12. So if you go back to lecture 12 and you look at the slide where we talked about first order reactions, there's an extra credit problem and this is very similar to that problem. So if you go through this solution, you can go back and probably solve that extra credit problem much more easily by doing the same method. So let's read this problem. If 64 atoms of A react with a half-life of 10 seconds, then how long until one atom remains? Now, a half-life of 10 seconds, let's remember that the half-life is the time that it takes for half of the reactant to turn into product. So if you start with 64 atoms of A, then after 10 seconds passes, you'll have 32 atoms remaining. And another 10 seconds passes means half of that reacts and you'll, left, or you'll be left with 16 atoms remaining. So we'll see that the solution to this problem will actually provide us with the integrated rate law. In order to solve this problem, you might construct a table like this, where at the very beginning, zero seconds, you have all 64 atoms. After 10 seconds passes, half of your reactant 
reacts and you're left with 32 atoms of A. Another 10 seconds passes, you're left with 16. Another 10, 8. Another 10, 4. Another 10, 2. And finally, after 60 seconds passes, you have one atom remain. So the answer to this question is that it takes 60 seconds for one atom to remain. But you may not want to construct a table like this. You may realize what's actually being done is that you're taking your initial number of atoms and you're multiplying it by one half times another half times another half times another times another and finally times six halves. So you want to take your initial number of atoms and multiply it by one half a certain number of times in order to get to one atom. And for this problem, we see that n is going to be equal to six. So it takes six half-lives for one atom to remain. Once you know how many half-lives it takes, then it's easy to calculate the time that it takes. The time is simply the number of half-lives n times the length of a half-life. So here we would take our six half-lives multiplied by 10 seconds per half-life to get 60 seconds. So again, we can use the equation to get the answer. Now this equation is going to lead to the integrated rate law. But before we do that derivation, let's go ahead and really verify that for first order reactions, the half-life is always 10 seconds because that's what we're counting on here. Every 10 seconds passes, half of the reactant disappears again. So that's sort of assumed. Now, this is unique to a first order reaction. First order reactions do have constant half-lives. A zero order and a second order reaction do not. So a first order reaction has a constant half-life. And that's what allows us to solve the problem using this equation. But can we verify that? Can we make sure that a first order reaction has a constant half-life? Well, yes, we can. And we'll do that by doing another quick experiment, kind of similar to the first one. This time, we'll start with one mole of A and Assuming that the half-life is 10 seconds, let's go ahead and see what happens. After 10 seconds reacts, half of it disappears and we're left with 0.5 moles of A. Another 10 seconds passes, we're left with 0.25. And another 10 seconds passes, we're left with 0.125 moles of reactant. So using this information right here, which corresponds with a constant half-life, can we check to see if this also corresponds with first order kinetics? And the way we would do that is to calculate the rates over these 10 second intervals. So over the first 10 second interval, what is the average rate? And let's remember that we calculate the rate as negative change in concentration of reactant divided by change in time. So although these are technically moles, we can just assume that our reaction is taking place in a one liter container, and therefore the moles would be the same as concentrations or molarities. So to calculate negative change in concentration over change in time, we would do change in concentration as final minus initial, that would give us 0.5 minus 1 would be negative 0.5 molarity. Dividing by the change in time, 10 minus 0, that's 10 seconds. So negative 0.5 molarity divided by 10 seconds would be negative 0.05 molarity per second. And since we take the negative of that, we would end up with a rate of positive 0.05 molarity per second. And over the next 10 second interval, the final minus initial concentration gives us negative 0.25 molarity divided by another 10 seconds, that would be negative 
0.025 molarity per second. And then with the negative sign, we get positive 0.025 molarity per second. And doing this again for the third 10 second interval, we'd be left with positive 0.0125 molarity per second. So what we want to check is do these rates correspond with first order kinetics? And let's remember what first order kinetics is. It tells us that the rate is linearly related to the concentration. Doubling the concentration doubles the rate and so on. So does that happen here? If we double the concentration, does the rate double? Well, yes it does. Look at the first 10 second interval. The concentrations are twice as much as they are during the ten next 10 second interval. And the rate is twice as fast as it is during the next 10 second interval. And again, going from 10 to 20 seconds versus 20 to 30 seconds, we see the concentration is twice as much during this interval as it is during that interval, and the rate is also twice as fast as it is during that interval. So yes, a constant half-life corresponds with first order kinetics. Doubling the concentration doubles the rate, and that is first order. So this is a very important yes here. Now this is not normally done in a text in general chemistry, but it's done right here for you. So the answer is yes, first order reactions do have a constant half-life, and yes, we can use this equation to get to the integrated rate law. So this equation is valid. The half-life is always constant. And that's why we use this equation. So let's continue on now with our algebra. Let's take this equation and rearrange it a little bit. If we multiply this equation by 2 to the n on both sides, then we would be left with this equation right here. So again, we get from this one to that one by multiplying both sides by 2 to the n power. 2 to the n times 1 half to the n would just give you 1. And so on the right hand side, we would be left with 1 times 2 to the n. So this is the same equation. It looks just a little bit different. Now, we're going to take this equation and work our way down here, which is basically our integrated rate law for this problem. So the first thing we do is take the natural log of both sides. And the natural log of a product is the sum of the natural logs. So we're left with this right here. And we're going to solve for the natural log of 1 by moving everything else to the other side and then flipping the entire equation around. And so we're left with this right here. And then finally, this exponent n, we're going to bring that in front of the natural log. We can do that. And so we're left with this equation right here. Now this is almost the integrated rate law. The last thing to do is to realize that n, which represents the number of half-lives, can be expressed in a different way. Let's go back and see that n is related to the total time that it takes as well as the half-life. If we divide both sides by the half-life, we see that n is the total time divided by the half-life. So let's rewrite it like that over here n is the total time divided by the half-life. Now we have our integrated rate law. So what we have with this equation really corresponds with that equation over there. And in that equation, we see that the natural log of the final concentration is equal to negative rate constant times the time that it takes plus the natural log of the initial concentration. So let's check. The natural log of the final number of atoms is equal to, now here the rate constant, the constant k, that's going to be the natural log of 2 divided by the half-life. 
The natural log of two never changes, and the half-life never changes for a first-order reaction. So we can just call these two numbers k uh, for our constant. So we're left with negative t times the rate constant plus the natural log of the initial number of atoms or the initial concentration. So this equation does lead to our integrated rate law. Now, you can see that it was pretty difficult to get there using algebra, but we were still able to do it. Let's do the calculus derivation very quickly. We take our differential rate law and write the corresponding calculus form. So our negative derivative of concentration with respect to time is equal to k times the concentration of A. And rearranging this a little bit, we are left with the following equation. And this is a straightforward integration. And so we're left with the integrated form. On the left hand side, we have the natural log of concentration of A integrated from initial to final concentration. And on the right, we have negative kt integrated from the initial to the final time. And so doing that definite integral, we're left with the natural log of the final concentration minus natural log of the initial concentration. That equals negative k times the final time minus k times the initial time. And we're basically almost home. What we do at this point is we set our initial time to zero, like we did for the zero order reaction in the last slide. That would cancel this term. And instead of calling it the final concentration, we'll just call it the concentration. And we're left with our integrated rate law. Now, the integrated rate law is a different way of expressing how fast the reaction goes. What we have here is a relation which tells us how the natural log of the concentration depends on the time. If we know the initial concentration and we know the rate constant, then we can plug in any time and then calculate the new natural log of the new concentration. But of course, if you know the natural log of the new concentration, you can figure out the new concentration. So really, what we have is the ability to plug in any time that has passed and then calculate how much concentration we have left. And that's what the integrated rate laws tell us. If you tell me how much time has passed, I will calculate and tell you how much concentration remains. Now, Again, this is compared with the differential rate law. Using the differential rate law to describe the reaction rate, you tell me how much concentration there is, and I will tell you how fast it's going. So two different ways to describe the reaction rate. Perhaps a better way to see how these ways are related is to plot them on a graph. Since the differential rate law tells us how the rate depends on the concentration, let's go ahead and plot rate versus concentration. And since the integrated rate law tells us how concentration depends on time, let's plot concentration versus time. Now, here's our differential rate law. In plotting rate versus concentration for several different concentrations, we should see that our points fall on a line. And that's because rate is linear related to concentration. So the points should fall on a straight line, and the slope of this line is the rate constant k. You have y equals mx type of equation, and so the slope in this line equals the rate constant k. Now, if you recall our zero order differential rate law, the rate was constant, and when we plotted rate versus concentration in that case, the rate never changed. It was a horizontal line. But here, it's, uh, it has a slope. Now, if we plot concentration versus time, and I've written the integrated rate law up here for you, the integrated rate law tells us that 
concentration is not linearly related to the time as it was in the zero case. So if we plot concentration versus time, we should not get points that fall on a straight line. We would get this sort of curved relationship. And at the very beginning, that would of course be our initial concentration, but as time progresses, the drop in the concentration would not be a linear drop. It would have this sort of curved nature to it. So this is not the plot that we want. Using a first order reaction, integrated rate law, we see that we should be plotting natural log of concentration versus the time. This is our y equals mx plus b type of an equation. And so rather than plotting the concentrations versus time, we'd calculate the natural logs of the concentrations and we plot them versus time and then those points would fall on a straight line. And in this case, at the very beginning, we would have the natural log of our initial concentration, which makes sense because at the beginning that's our, our initial concentration, so that would be natural log of the initial concentration. And the slope would be the negative rate constant. And we can see that from the integrated rate law. So it's a little bit different than it is for a zero order reaction, but you can still see the relation between integrated and differential. A reaction is second order with respect to its reactant. If the rate law tells us that the rate, which is this expression, is a constant times the concentration squared. Now, we can take this differential rate law and using the same sort of calculus derivation, derive the corresponding integrated rate law. And I'll remind you what we did. We turned our differential rate law into its calculus form. And then using the power rule, we got to the integrated rate law. And that's what we do here again. Now I'm not going to go through the steps in this case. You can stop the video and check them if you like. But the point is that we used the same technique in calculus, but this time it's not so easy to do using algebra. In fact, I don't know how to do it. If any of you out there in the audience know of an algebraic derivation, or if you see one, then please let me know and I'll probably cite it in the notes below this video on YouTube. But when you're dealing with second or even higher order reactions, it's much easier to use calculus to get to the integrated rate law. However, it's not as important to be able to derive the integrated rate law as it is to be able to use it. So let's have a look at this rate law. The integrated rate law tells us that the inverse concentration, which is one over the new concentration, is equal to the rate constant times the time that has passed plus one over the initial concentration. Now again, the integrated rate law tells us the relation between time and concentration. If you tell me how much time has passed, I can plug it in, as long as I know the rate constant and initial concentration, I can calculate the new inverse concentration. And of course, if you know the inverse concentration, you can get back to the new concentration. Again, the integrated rate law explains the relationship between time and concentration, whereas the differential rate law explains the relationship between concentration and rate. Two alternative ways to express the reaction rate. Now, the integrated rate law, again, has a linear form, but this time it's the inverse concentration which plays our y variable. So if we're to compare these two rate laws on a graph, the differential rate law, we are going to again plot concentration as our x variable and rate as our y variable, but for the integrated rate law, we can see that it's the inverse concentration, which is our y variable. And again, time is our x variable. So let's see these plots. Here's our differential rate law again. 
And we can see that the rate is a constant times the concentration squared. So if we plot the rates of several concentrations, then these points should fall on a parabola. And that's what they do. And as the concentration increases, the rate really starts to increase. It's related to the concentration squared. But for the concentration versus time, if we try to plot that, just concentration versus time for several points, then they would not fall on a line. And that's because for a second order reaction, it's not concentration which is linear with time, but it's the inverse concentration which is linear with time. And that's what the integrated rate law is telling us. Now, if we take the same data and we calculate the inverse concentrations and we plot them versus time, then they would fall on a line. And this time, that line would be sloped upwards. And we can see that at the very beginning, our y-intercept would be 1 over the initial concentration. And that's what the equation also tells us. And also, the slope of this line we can see is simply the rate constant k. Now, before we move on, let's go ahead and have a look at one more important equation, and that's the half-life equation. Recall that the half-life is the time, t, that it takes for one half of the initial concentration to react. So it's the amount of time that it takes for half of the reactant to disappear. Now, in order to reach that point, the new concentration will end up being equal to one half of the initial concentration. So that's the situation that occurs when you've reached the half-life time. Your new concentration is simply one half of the previous concentration. Now, if we want to figure out how much time it takes to get there, what we can do is we can use this as our new concentration and plug that into the integrated rate law. So 1 over the new concentration is k times the time plus 1 over the initial concentration. Now, if we solve for the time, that's going to be the half-life time. So doing that, solving for the time, you do a little bit of algebra, and the time is 1 over the rate constant over the initial concentration. But this time, let's observe that the half-life time is not constant, as it was during the first order reaction. If you recall from our previous slide, the half-life was always constant. The half-life never changed. It was always 10 seconds, or whatever it is. So every 10 seconds that passes, half of your reactant disappears again. But this time, the half-life changes depending on what your previous concentration was. Now, perhaps this is a little bit difficult to comprehend without looking at some experimental data. So here's some sample data for us to look at. At different times, we have the measured concentrations of the reactant. Now, before we look at the half-life, let's first make sure this is a second-order reaction. And for second-order reactions, you recall that if you double the concentration of the reactant, then it should go four times as fast. So let's make sure that's happening over here. So at different times, here are the corresponding concentrations. Now let's calculate a couple of rates and compare them with the concentrations. So over the first 10 second interval, the rate, which is this expression right here, would be final minus initial concentration, which would give us negative 0.64 molarity. And that's divided by the final minus the initial time. So we would end up getting negative 0.064 molarity per second. But with the negative sign, we get positive 0.064 molarity per second, and that's the average rate over the first interval. 
Now the next interval is actually 20 seconds long, but we can still calculate the average rate over this. The final minus the initial concentration would give us negative 0.32 molarity. Dividing by 20 seconds would give us negative 0.016 molarity per second, but with the negative sign we get positive 0.016 molarity per second. Now let's see if this is second order. We can see that the first interval, the concentrations are twice as much as they are during the second interval. And the rate is four times as fast as it is during the second interval. So this is a second order situation right here. Now let's check out the half-life. Well, the half-life is almost automatically given to us in this case. It's simply the time that it takes for half of the reactant to disappear. And we can see that right here, during this interval, it's 10 seconds that it takes for half of the reactant to disappear. But during the next interval, it's 20 seconds. To go from 0.64 to 0.32, it takes us 20 seconds. So the half-life is growing. The longer the reaction progresses, the longer the half-life is. Now I've added some more data for you to look at if you like, and you can see that as the reaction progresses, the half-life increases. So that's what occurs for a second order reaction. The half-life does change. Now, one final point, which is sort of as an aside, if you wanted to calculate the rate constant given this experimental data, we can see that the rate constant is related to the half-life and the previous concentration. And you can use any two pairs of points to get this. So we can use the first uh, two sets of data. And using this equation, solve for the rate constant, which is one over the half-life over the initial concentration. And here, the half-life is 10 seconds, and the initial concentration is 1.28 molarity. So calculating this, we would get a rate constant of 0 0.0781 molarity to the negative one, second to the negative one. Since we've covered so much ground involving the reaction rate, it's probably a good idea to summarize what we've been through. So let's begin with our old friend, the generic reaction. A plus B forms C. Now here there are three ways to define the reaction rate. That's because we have three different species. For instance, the rate of change of reactant A would be change in concentration of A over change in time. But these three rates are not equivalent unless we precede them by the proper factors. And the reactants are preceded by negative one over their coefficient and the product by positive one over its coefficient. Then the three rates would be equivalent and we can call that the rate of the reaction. But there's a different way to determine the reaction rate and that's using the differential rate law. The differential rate law tells us how the rate depends on the concentrations of the reactants. And specifically, it says that the rate equals a constant times the concentrations raised to certain exponents. These exponents are called the orders with respect to the reactants, and this is called the rate constant. Now, every reaction has its own differential rate law, and if you know what the differential rate law is, meaning you know what the exponents are, and you know what the rate constant is, then you can substitute in any concentrations and calculate how fast it would be going. So it's a pretty useful equation to know. Now, when we talked about the differential rate law in our previous lecture, we went through the three cases, zero order, first order, and second order. So let's recall those briefly. A reaction is zero order when the exponent with respect to the reactant equals zero. And since the concentration raised to the zero power is simply one, then that would not be involved in the differential rate law. And so for a zero order reaction, the rate is constant with respect to that reactant.
So this is a pretty simple differential rate law. It simply says that the rate is constant. It does not depend on the concentration at all. So we saw that that's the case for an enzyme system. For an enzyme, it doesn't matter how much reactant you have in there, the rate of the reaction is always the same. So it's a pretty interesting case. You can go back and look at lecture 12 to see how the enzyme works. Now, in this differential rate law, the units of the rate constant are molarity to the one power, seconds to the negative one power. We saw that nuclear decay is a first order situation. And a reaction is first order when the rate is equal to a constant times the concentration raised to the one power. Now this time, if you double the concentration of the reactant, the rate would double. It would be twice as fast. And if you triple the concentration, the rate would triple, and so on. So again, that's nuclear decay. It exhibits first order kinetics. Now here, the rate constant has units of seconds to the negative one power. Now, we saw that a second order situation is exhibited by the collision model. This time, the rate is equal to a constant times the concentration squared. And here, if you double the concentration, the rate quadruples. So that's the collision model. Here, the rate constant has units of molarity to the negative one, seconds to the negative one. Now, the differential rate law, no matter which case you're talking about, it tells us how the rate of the reaction depends on the concentrations. So rate depends on concentration. But what we can do is we can take these three differential rate laws and derive the corresponding integrated rate laws. And the integrated rate laws tell us how the concentration depends on the time. And if you have a zero order reaction, it's the concentration which is linear with time. If it's first order, it's natural log, which is linear with time. And if it's second order, it's the inverse concentration, which is linear with time. So we'll compare these two types of rate laws using graphs in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at the corresponding half-life equations for zero, first, and second order. Now, in our previous slide, we derived the half-life expression for a second-order reaction. And you can see um, that it depends on the rate constant as well as the initial concentration. You can use the same sort of technique to get the half-life equation for first and zero-order reactions. But what you want to notice here is that if the reaction is first-order, then the half-life does not depend on the initial concentration. It's just the natural log of two divided by the rate constant. And since it doesn't depend on the initial concentration, the half-life is always going to give you the same number. It's always constant. So it's always 10 seconds or whatever. So if it's 10 seconds, then every 10 seconds, then half of your reactant reacts. So that was the case for nuclear decay, the half-life was always the same. So if you have a zero order or second order reaction, the half-life changes as the reaction proceeds. But for first order reactions, the half-life is always constant. So that's an interesting situation. Now let's take these differential and integrated rate laws and compare them uh, using graphs. And since differential rate laws tell us how rate depends on concentration, we'll plot rate versus concentration. And for the integrated rate laws, we'll plot the corresponding terms versus time. So here are the plots for zero, first, and second order reactions. Here are the differential rate law plots and the integrated rate law plots. So if a reaction is zero order and you plot rate versus concentration for several points, then we should see that those points fall along a horizontal line. And that's because the rate is always constant for a zero order reaction. 
it's always the rate constant. So again, the rate is simply constant. If a reaction is first order, then the rate is linear with concentration. So we should see the points fall along a line, and we do. If you plot rate versus concentration for a first order reaction, then you would get the points falling along a line, and the slope of this line we can see is the rate constant. If a reaction is second order, then the rate depends on the concentration squared, so this time the points should fall along a parabola, and that's what we see happen. We see the points falling along a parabola. And as the concentration increases, the rate really starts to increase, since it depends on the concentration squared. Now, the corresponding integrated rate laws, for a zero order reaction, we see that the concentration is linear with time. And so the points, if you plot concentration versus time, should fall along a line. Now, here you want to notice that the y-intercept is the initial concentration. And the slope of this line, we can see, is the negative rate constant. If a reaction is first order, then we should be plotting the natural logs of the concentrations versus time. And only then would the points fall along a line. If you have a first order reaction and you try plotting concentration versus time, the points would not fall along a line. So if it's first order, you have to plot natural log of concentrations versus time. Then they would fall along a straight line. And this time, the y-intercept would be the natural log of the initial concentration. And again, the slope of the line would be the negative rate constant. Now, a second order reaction, it's the inverse concentration, which is linear versus time. So here the points would fall along a line, which is sloped upwards this time. Now the y-intercept is simply the inverse of the initial concentration. And this time the slope is simply k. So there is a lot of information on this slide in regards to kinetics. But before we continue on in our next video, let's do one more example in which we determine the order of a reactant, but this time we'll use the integrated rate laws. If a chemist needs to determine the reaction order and or the rate constant of a chemical reaction, then it's probably easier to do an experiment and then use the integrated rate law versus the differential rate law, as we did in our previous lecture. Let's take a look at how we do this using the integrated rate law. Given this simple reaction, cyclobutane, C4H8, forms two ethylene molecules. Now, we can get a better look at this reaction. Cyclobutane is a four-member carbon ring, and each carbon has two hydrogens. And what happens during the reaction is this molecule splits apart into two equivalent pieces, which are the ethylene molecules. Now suppose we want to determine the order of the reaction with respect to the cyclobutane, as well as the rate constant. Well, what you can do in the laboratory is you can run this experiment and at several different times measure the corresponding concentrations of the reactants. And given this set of data, which is pretty simple to collect, we can then go on to determine the reaction order. Now, what we'll need, in addition to the concentrations at these times, are the natural logs of the concentrations and also the inverse concentrations. So we would calculate the natural log of one, which is zero, and the corresponding natural logs of the rest of the concentrations, and also the inverse concentrations. So one divided by the concentration would give us this set of numbers right here. Now, these three sets of numbers are going to help us determine if it's zero order, first order, or second order. And it's pretty simple to do at this point. Once you have the proper 
numbers, all you have to do is plot the proper graphs. So let's look at these three graphs. If we want to check if the reaction is zero order, then we would plot the concentrations versus times. So these would be our xy points. Here's one point and the rest of the points. And if you plot these points on a concentration versus time plot, you would see that the points form this sort of curved shape. Now remember that we're looking for a line. So that may not be it right there. That might be a little bit too curved. So we'll take our next set of numbers and we'll plot these versus those, the natural log of the concentration versus time. And this time, the points do look like they fall on a straight line. But let's go ahead and check the third set of numbers. So we'll plot the inverse concentration versus time. So these will be our xy points. In doing that, we get this third plot, which now is sloped upwards, but it looks like the yellow points sort of are curved again. Now, if we're not quite sure which one looks the most linear, what we can do is draw the best fit line, or the linear least squared regression line, through those points. And what the computer would do would be to take these set of points and draw the most representative line going through those points. And you can ask the computer to give you the equation of the line as well as the r squared value. And the r squared value tells you how linear your points are. So r squared values closer to 1 mean that the points are more linear. So if we draw the best fit line through these points, we get the following equation with its r squared value. And if we do it for the natural log versus time, we get its equation and r squared value. And also for the inverse concentrations versus time. And what you look for at this point is the r squared value that's closest to 1. In comparing these three, we can see that it's going to come from this plot, because our r squared value is 0.999. And that's telling us that these points are very linear. So this is the equation of the line that we get. Now don't forget that this equation represents the integrated rate law. When you plot natural log versus time, well, if it's first order, then the natural log of the concentration is linear with time. And that's why these points fall on a line, because it is first order. So we have identified this as a first order reaction since the r squared value is closest to 1 here. And at this point we can simply read off the rate constant. We know from the integrated rate law that the slope of the line would be the negative rate constant, which is negative 0.0112. And therefore the rate constant is the opposite of that, and it's positive 0.0112. So you see it's a pretty simple procedure to determine the reaction order as well as the rate constant. Now in our next lecture we're going to study several factors that affect the reaction rate. And the most important one is the temperature. So far we've been leaving the temperature out of the equation, but in our next video we'll see how the temperature can help speed up a reaction. And what it actually affects is the rate constant. So the rate constant does depend on temperature. And we'll see exactly what that relation is. So stay tuned for that. Aloha.